The next photo, would you believe that's a T20 International? Don't see that too many times in a T20, do you? But I've put this photo up to talk about briefly what it is like to deal with pressure and to focus on what's important. Very early on in my test match career, the first year I joined ICC, I had the pleasure of doing an India-Pakistan series, the first time they'd played cricket after many, many years. I did that series with David Shepherd, Ranjan Matagali, and Rudy Kutson. The environment in Karachi was quite unique. We were escorted out of the hotel with red carpet. However, it wasn't out the front door, it was out the back door. The red carpet was lined with people with machine guns. We were escorted into buses. The journey between the hotel and the ground was cordoned off to normal traffic. Petrol stations were closed for fear of bomb attacks. We got to the ground and we go through three metal detectors before we enter the change room. Welcome to Test Match Cricket in Pakistan. Handling pressure. I was just there to umpire a game of cricket, I thought. So what it's about is about keeping it simple. Watching the ball, focusing hard, keeping a clear mind and staying in the here and now. Shutting out distractions. I haven't met a cricket umpire who doesn't go out on the field of play saying to themselves, gee, I hope I don't stuff up today. Got to turn that around and we've got to say what a great opportunity we've got to go out in front of people today and show them how good we are and turn that into a positive. Even planning for tonight, you can be driven by the fear of failure and walking away with a few negatives, but what a great opportunity to get in front of people and the cricketing world and promote our side of the sport. Nerves are good. I've got a few right now and they're keeping me on my toes. Setting small targets is also important. First ball, first over, first hour, first session, start again. First ball, first over, first hour, first session, start again. And then you've only got 13 to go in a test match. <laughs> I often liken an umpire to being like a pilot. Hours and hours of observation interspersed with a couple of minutes of panic. However, when things go wrong in the cockpit, you want your best pilot on deck. So umpires do play an important role here. Players are very generally good with us. We earn their respect through performance and hard work, as I mentioned, and we deal with a constant media focus. England and India are particularly good at it. Staying in the same hotel as either of those two teams puts a lot of adverse pressure on all of us. I certainly don't read a newspaper if I think there's going to be something in there I don't want to read. I certainly don't keep looking up quick info. And I certainly don't go watching TV, TV highlights when I know there's something bad about to happen. What I would say about dealing with pressure and focusing on what's important is that we can't be perfect, but we can be excellent. And I think that's really the key when handling pressure and focusing on what's important. The next photo, there we have a scene from Mumbai. Oway Shah and Munaf Patel getting to know each other a bit better. This one deals with player behaviour and conflict management. I believe one of the great skills of a cricket umpire is to be able to empathise with what the players are going through at the time. Mumbai, 35 degrees, 85% humidity, five day game, tensions get high. Cricket umpiring and player management is all about picking your battles and knowing when to step in and when to let them have their say. Your judgment and management of standards of behaviour is just as important as a, as a court behind down the leg side. We do have a good code of conduct and we apply that consistently where we, where we can. We don't like applying the code of conduct and we will try to manage every situation as uniquely and as fairly as possible. Test cricket's hard, that's why they call it a test. We expect the players to play hard, but we also expect them to play fairly. First class domestic cricket has a role to play there. It should be a filtering system. You should get a few knocks in first class cricket. You should go through a few battles. It sorts out the men from the boys and players like Shane Warne, Glenn McGrath, even Darren Lehman, Greg Matthews, names spring to mind. 
they're a good test of character and you learn a lot from those sorts of people. And when you can manage those players well and they respond and they are good people, then you know you've got what it takes and they build confidence with you. You manage the player and you manage the situation. Out of conflict does come the opportunity to build good relationships. And out of that situation, I knew what Munaf had said in his local language, and he was more surprised than I was. But out of that now, him and I have a great relationship and every time we see each other, we go back to this moment. That was eight years ago. And we remain good friends. However, I have no problem ruling not in his favour if he's bowling from my end. I don't have a problem with players appealing as much as they like, providing they respect the answer. Ball after ball, how's that, how's that, how's that? Not a problem. But when we say out or not out, they respect the decision and move on. I remain constantly impressed with people like MS Dhoni, Raul Dravid, Sachin Tendulkar, and the way that they cope with the expectations of a nation of 1.2 billion people. They are good human beings. They do give their time in hotels. They are good people to talk with. They've offered me some great advice in the past and I've learned a lot from them. The last photo I want to show you in this particular segment is of Dave Shepherd. My point here is that we have some great people in our game and we owe it to ourselves to learn as much from them when we can. This photograph was taken back in 2003 during my first World Cup. And we weren't on duty, but we went to go and watch a game. Those few hours I spent with David, ahead of my 2004 series with him, were invaluable. Shep cared. He really cared about his umpiring. He really cared about cricket. And that was infectious, and I learned a lot from that discussion. He cared so much that in his last test match, he made an error right towards the back end of the game. And those of you who know Shep know that he loves his ice cream. Shep's also a diabetic. Wasn't supposed to have ice cream. And Jenny would get very upset if she found out that he was sneaking some on the side. Shep would have the ice cream at the end of a day's play. But on this particular occasion, having made a mistake, he felt that he didn't deserve it. He cared that much. He put the game ahead of his own interests. Other heroes I'd like to acknowledge here include my boss, Mr Vincent Funderbale. Great man, behind the scenes, and a great mentor. We all learn so much from our people in our game. We should never forget that. So what does the spirit of cricket mean for me? Firstly, the central theme is respect. From 1744, when the laws were first codified through to today and into the future, my desire is that that central value of respect remains constant. The game has changed over the past two and a half centuries and it will continue to change. But it's vital that some things remain constant, they being the values of respect, the basis of fair play and a balanced contest between bat and ball. We need to learn from the past, taking those intrinsic values forward assess the present, celebrate it, and be visionary for the future to ensure the game of cricket survives and grows. So let's look at respect for the past. Cricket's established some great traditions that make it what it is today and make it unique. Many of our common values have been centered around such colloquials, expressions like, it's just not cricket, which relates to fairness, a gentleman's game, relating to honor, and respect amongst competitors and doing the right thing when required. Spirit of cricket, even though something might be technically right, applying a high standard of morals and integrity when playing, not to engage in cheating or take undue advantage of someone else's misfortune. Then we have the conventions of the game that have been established over time. Today we continue to respect those traditional conventions when we start plying our trade as umpires. We're the first to walk onto the field and the last to walk off. 
spare a thought for us at a tea break or an innings break in a test match where we have the least amount of time off the field. I'm not expecting any sympathy there, by the way. <laughs> when only one umpire is present, it is certainly expected in the game of cricket that we officiate both ends. Normally a stand-in player will stand at square leg and help us out. We also normally collect the bowler's hat at the umpire's end and we hand it to him at the end of the over and we hold it for that entire over as a service. No doubt many of you don't think much of that, but I can tell you if you have to hold the hat of people like Greg Matthews, Anil Kumble and Chiminda Vass, you'll realise what a sweaty, unlaundered <laughs> hat can do to your clothing as well as your hands. <laughs> More danger money coming please. I started umpiring in the early 1990s, just when third umpires were being brought into international cricket for line decisions. And you might recall the outcry that started when we first started giving batsmen out by centimetres, stumped or run out. It was also an age when there was one home board appointment and one ICC appointment to a test match in the middle. As we alluded to, my test career started at Boxing Day Melbourne 2000. There were no ICC contracts. There were no ball trackers. There was no hotspot. No 2020 cricket, no international umpire training workshops. The uniform was quite basic. I supplied my own white business shirt. The match referee of the day was Mr A.C. Smith and he gave me some National Grid stickers to put on my shirt. My partner for that test match was Venkat and our teamwork was summarised by our pre-match chat as we walked out to start the game and I asked him, Venks, which end shall we go to? Venks quickly replied, well, I don't care which end you go to, but I'm going to that end. <laughs> We've come a long way since then. So let's look at respect for the present. Today, I've umpired as a full-time contracted umpire, spending more than half the year working abroad each year. We have three international formats of the game, test matches, ODIs and T20s. I finished test matches under floodlights to maximise playing time. I've umpired under DRS, non-DRS and a mixture of both. I've had to sometimes publicly accept and reverse the decision error after it's being dissected by the third umpire on a giant replay screen. I've left a test match unfinished, lucky to still be alive after being involved in a terrorist attack. I've umpired following journeys of over 16,000 kilometres and been on the field 72 hours later. In today's cricket, the use of technology, here we go guys, the use of technology has shown how difficult the job of an umpire is. In most TV broadcasts there are around 32 cameras to capture the action of a ball being bowled at around 145 kilometres an hour, the batsman speeding between the wickets and fielders, fielders catching the ball close to the ground or trying to slide and prevent boundaries up to 80 metres away. Every moment of the player is under the microscope, both on and off the field, and every moment the umpire is also under intense scrutiny. There is at least one camera on the umpire all the time, watching his every move and facial expression, waiting to capture that decision for all to see, and be replayed as many times as the director sees fit. In today's cricket, the decision of the, third um, uh, the, sorry, the, decision of the umpire is scrutinised by all those cameras, including slow motion, ultra motion, hotspot front on, hotspot side on, hotspot offside, ball tracking, prediction, snicko, stump audio, the mat, and then, if that's not enough, by up to three experts in the commentary box. After all that public scrutiny and technology, there's often divided opinion about what the correct decision was. Was he out or was he not out? 